Psychology at the University of Copenhagen and president of the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences and Letters. Dr. Hestrup received her PhD, her first PhD, at Oxford University, publishing numerous articles and books. In Iceland, early on, she delved into Icelandic medieval history as a historical anthropologist, and this work led to her second doctoral degree at the University of Copenhagen. Indeed, Dr. Hestrup's career bears the imprint of a strong spirit of adventure. In 2009, she conceived and directed the Waterworlds Project, in which 15 researchers collectively explored local and social responses to environmental disasters linked to water. And the people, the very people who are seeking certainty and safety and shelter in climate-exposed environments, and out of which a number of highly acclaimed collected, collective volumes on fieldwork methods and theory, not to mention climate change, have sprung. Following in the footsteps of her childhood hero, the Danish explorer Knud Rasmussen, it, to, it, to, to Greenland, she has been conducting critical research on life and survival on rapidly thinning sea ice in the region. And today she directs, she both conceived and directs a large-scale Arctic uh, research project that combines many disciplines uh, called the NOW project. And it's studying a very unique Arctic marine area in the Thule region. Along with her many significant writings on anthropological theory, on the nature of ethics, and of the field in contemporary ethnography, on the will to knowledge, and even on wonder, uh, Dr. Hastrup has also probed the relationship between theater and anthropology, having done professional theater, particularly in the English Shakespearean tradition. Undeniably, she is one of the most sensitive and analytically compelling anthropologists engaging the field of climate change and its tragedies, I would say, today, capturing the patience and wisdom of her interlocutors as they ponder their options. She shows how entanglements of both natural and social processes are not merely metaphorical or discursive, but literally matters of life and death that calls for serious reflection on the nature of society and the future. Dr. Hastrup's talk is entitled, A Permanent State of Extinction, The Case of the Tool People in Northwest Greenland. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Hastrup. Almost over, <laughs> overdone welcome. <laughs> I do appreciate it, of course, but, but most of all, I would like to thank all of you for inviting me and for being here today and, and sharing some of my recent thoughts on extinction. Actually, they're spurred precisely by the invitation to talk here. It's not a term I've used, but it's certainly one that I begin to ponder. And I hope we can have a, a good discussion afterwards, because I'm newer to this field than you are, probably. But there, in, in my presentation here today, I, I discuss this issue of extinction uh, with reference to the uh, high Arctic hunting community in northwest Greenland called the Thule, Thule people, or uh, the Inuit as is their own name, but it's not one that they, they use a lot because they know who they are, they don't know a name, they say. Uh, and uh, it is actually the northernmost community on the globe. It's truly marginal even within Greenland. And currently, it seems to be radically challenged by global warming. And there are indeed massive changes to the ice cover and to the opportunities for hunting. And a particular kind of life may actually be on the way. On the basis of having worked there over the past nine years with regular field trips, I know that they too sometimes see their community as beleaguered by a changing environment. What I'm going to give you here is, is more of a case than it is an analysis. There will be hints to, probable, to possible ana analytical courses. But what I, I wanted to do here was to present what I see as sort of a high definition or high resolution case by which we can 
we can see how extinction is not always a matter of either law, but also a matter of ideas and of observations and of comings and goings and previous histories. And it seems to me that this particular people, I mean, they have been portrayed as always sort of living on the brink of extinction. And so, in a sense, they've been caught up in, a, in sort of an, um, between what I call an outside and an inside gate, because they knew how they were and who they were, and they knew how to survive, barely sometimes, but outsiders coming into the region always had this, this particular perspective on, the, of, on them on them as being sort of on the brink of some disaster or other. And for me, while studying studying with them over the past many years here, it's been very it's been absolutely vital not to, to victimize them, but to engage in a proper talk and I can see how over the years mood changes and so do their sense of future opportunities. And I think that's kind of always been so in, in this region. But then anyway, I'm going to pose some questions to the notion of extinctions as I go by. But I'd start by some historical look, looking back a bit into history, seeing how the concepts that Europeans have formed have contributed to this sense of doom that has been connected to this particular people. It is a very small people, there are only 700 left in this vast region and they have been cut off from the rest of Greenland for centuries as I shall come back to. But there's no sense of sort of imminent death, I mean that's not what we were talking about, so rest assured. But um, in the Arctic I argue that European travel and exploration always had a distinct flavour. It uh, seemed like an act of stretching the limits of the world when it was first uh, brought into the uh, view of the European and American explorers. And this was, of course, partly a way of a, a consequence of a particular European way of thinking about maps and upon relying on ancient metaphors. <coughs> and it was further cemented in modern travel writing where the rest of the world was described from the vantage point of a very Eurocentric planetary consciousness, as Mary Louise Pratt has talked about. The far north had to wait longer than most other regions to be included into this planetary consciousness. It was largely inaccessible and the imagination had to be stretched to accommodate it. And of course ships had to be built to be able to conquer it. But one pertinent image in the European representations of the far north since classical times was the ancient image of Ultima Thule situated on the edge of the horizon where life was barely possible, not only human life, but all life. It was on the brink of impossibility. There was a persistent trend in classical writings. Now, just geography, of course, is in, in some sense always imaginative, as Edward Said reminded us, drawing upon received images. And of course, it's drawing on received images and categories. And he said that in geography, there's always something more than what appears to be merely positive knowledge. And this more is a set of preconceptions and imaginative horizons, such as we know from the persistent sets of the Arctic sublime, you can see a picture here, which inspire romantic paper painters to formidable pieces on the basis of actual expeditions. This one was inspired by Caspar David Friedrich, uh, and he, he painted it in 18... Uh, 18 uh, 23 to 24, and was based upon the reports made by William Perry when he returned from one of these early Arctic expeditions in, in search for the Northwest Passage. He did survive, actually, but as you can see here, there was this sense of the lingering danger, the, the ice somehow being its own argument. There's no way you could argue back when you first were in the claws of the ice, and you could see the ship going down over there to the right. And this sort of Arctic sublime was a persistent trope in, during the 19th century. And it also, it also added to the sense of heroism that the Arctic explorers would sort of entertain as they went to the north. <coughs> One of the um, explorers, I mean, the, the explorers in their dis descriptions of their own uh, uh, achievements, they often focused very much on their own sense of achievement, discovering always an unknown world, 
and forgetting entirely that for some people it was actually well known. For Fridtjof Nansen, who you see here, and who was a major Norwegian player on the scene of polar exploration around 1900, it was essential to respond to what he called the call of the unknown. When in 1925 he was appointed Lord Rector of St Andrews University in Scotland, he gave a talk to the students in which he spoke of courage and the spirit of adventure to urging them along, and then he continued. It is our perpetual yearning to overcome difficulties and dangers, to see hidden things, to penetrate into the regions outside our beaten track. It is the call of the unknown and the stress that, the longing for the land of beyond, the divine force deeply rooted in the soul of man which drove the first hunters out into new regions, the mainspring perhaps of our greatest actions, winged human thought knowing no bounds to its freedom. He's referring here to some of the Inuit people. He knew the Greenlanders well by that time. He'd sojourned there also for some time. So, so these were the people who made that, and he's sort of encouraging students to follow the same path. And he continued, and we find in the lives of men who have done anything, of those who, whom we call great men, men, that it is this spirit of adventure, the call of the unknown, that has lured and urged them along their course. So the longing for the beyond, I mean, that's really what Tula was at the time. So that was where people really also began to, to see this farther and impenetrable north where ships used to go down. So added to the uh, this Arctic sublime, that was this persi persistent art, artistic and literary trope in 19th century Europe, there was also a remarkable degree of, uh, of masculine heroics further underscoring their own astonishment that people have, could actually have truly human lives in this region. And I'm going to argue that, that this, their own sense of wonder and possibility perhaps sort of inflected their descriptions in a particular direction. And I'll give you some examples of this in a minute. But before we get there, we have to get to the uh, Tula station that you can see here, and for whom these people were eventually named. Because this, this image of Tula persistently influenced explorers' descriptions of the northernmost inhabitants, including this inner population of northern Greenland, later to become known as the Tula people. They were named, named after this trading station that Knud Rasmussen, my childhood hero, as that woman has said, uh, established in 1910. And, and it was a deliberate act on his part to deliberate to, to place to finally place ancient Tula at a particular place in geography. Until then, it had been a floating image. For some hundred years, it grew to Iceland as well. But now, finally, it became located in, in geography. But the ancient images, of course, followed suit. So, and this was the more of geography and of the name indeed. At the time, about 250 people lived in the region along a very narrow coastline that stretched over about a thousand kilometers. <coughs> For them, of course, mobility was, was essential, not only to hunt, but also to maintain a sense of community. They lived in very small settlements, and they had spring settlements, winter settlements, and, and <coughs> meeting each other and establishing more permanent settlements over winter, but, but it was a very mobile people. Today, the sea ice is still the most important infrastructure, I mean, the infrastructure that carried them from one settlement to the next. At the time, they could rely on about 10 months of fast ice, uh, and then two months of sort of open water where they could hunt from, from their kayaks. But otherwise, they were totally dependent on their dog sledges to, to, to connect with each other and to get to the game and the open waters where they were found. And the sea ice is, Yet, although the sea ice is dwindling, it is still the most important infrastructure. And, and because it is dwindling, the community and the totality, the wholeness of the region is, is becoming ever more circumscribed. Some of the settlements are becoming depopulated, people are moving together, because when they cannot meet for perhaps six or eight months a year due to the changing infrastructure, they rather uh, they sort of gather together larger settlements, mainly in the, the main town. There are only three small settlements left out of some 14 just a couple of generations ago. 
Since the establishment of the Tule station, the entire region was named after it. But in Greenland, the name for the place is Avanosuak, meaning the big north. And it is still, when seen from, from southern Greenland, it is still not only the very big north, it's also far north and the largely unknown north, even for people uh, in more southern parts in, in Greenland. <coughs> yeah. I shall take you to... In many ways, Greenland is still sort of the last vestige of the ice age. And you can see here, this is sort of a figure of the, the, the cover of the ice in, during the last ice age, age uh, withdrawing some uh, 20, 10 to 12,000 uh, years ago, but, but remaining in Greenland, so to speak. And some of the early cartographers of Greenland, uh, notably like the who traveled with Knud Rasmussen, mm -hmm. uh, he described in a very lyrical passage how traveling from south to north in Greenland, and there you can see, so. mm. Anyway, here we are. Traveling up from, north, from south to north in Greenland, that was in the early 20th century, was like sort of traveling back towards the ice. Uh, age and up here still in the inland ice and the very persistent uh, ice up there it's, it's the higher Arctic perhaps the sort of the coldest and, and less hospi hospitable regions uh, on the earth it's a kind of a desert the notion of a desert has often been used for this ice icy place but thanks to the ice covering this entire region and containing the water the northern <coughs> seas had a lower level and this allowed people to walk over from Asia to America, it's over here, um, and, and, and in an act of retrospective naming, the passage has become known as Beringia from today's Bering Strait. So uh, already then, uh, that was when America was first populated, there was a close connection between movement of people and climate. Uh, and as archaeologists have shown, there has been a persistent uh, uh, movement of, of cultures into to Greenland across or along the northern uh, coastlands. <coughs> this is actually a, a map made by uh, of Knuas, which was expeditions. I'm not going to talk about him rest assured, but I want to show you that this is the Tula region, and this is so it's all his expeditions. This was the starting point for most of what he did and, and he was the one actually to trace back the connections between all of the Inuit peoples living in North America. He did that on, on a three year long expedition from 1921 to, to 24 and he was, because he was part Greenlanding and he was uh, he'd grown up in, in, in Greenland and he made a lot of it, he'd stayed over in Tula many times for long stays so he was well versed in Greenland, but he was able to understand all the people right to, to Alaska and even across to Siberia. So he, he connected all these people and, and actually he proved in some way that people had moved towards Greenland along this uh, ice, uh, along this icy coast. There's a lot more complications to that feature. I just wanted to, to show you two things about Tula. First, that he, it became the bridge across which one population after the other, one wave of immigration from America entered into Greenland and moved down uh, along the, the coast. Uh, many of these early prehistoric cultures, the first one is traced back to 4,500 years before our time, so that's 2,500 be, uh, before the uh, Common Era. Uh, but, uh, but it died out and then other waves came and they also disappeared and the question is again this disappearance of these prehistoric cultures is that sort of the same as extinction or what is it are we facing just contractions and expansions in a region where such are necessary given the high the demanding uh, climate but greenland was completely depopulated for a period of about 800 years from about 100 uh, after in the common era and until sort of ninth century uh, in, in our uh, time. Uh, but 
the last wave of immigration action, that was a very small group that came over, but then came the last wave of immigrants that sort of repopulated all of Greenland. And before, because it had come over there, because the first archaeological traces was found in the Thule region, this last immigration of these people was called the Thule Eskimos, or the Thule people, taking the name from where they were first identified in the <coughs> Middens. And they were great hunters of whale and seal and walrus, and they had big communal boats, umiak, umiaks as they're called, as well as kayaks, and of course they had the dog sledge as the dogs. They were highly mobile people who gradually settled along the entire west coast and even part of the east coast of Greenland. Now, what facilitated this last move also down to, along the west coast of Greenland was what has become known as the warm medieval period. I mean, waters opened up, it became milder, people could, could migrate, and, and above all, they could cross this sort of Melville Bay that was a very hard thing to cross. But, but at the time, they, there were open waters, and it's packed with ice most of the year. And still, it's only about a couple of months every year that, that ships can, can pass up to Tula. But, but at the time, there were still open, there were opening waters where they could get seal, and they could, so they could hunt on all their way down to these this very distant destinations further south in, in Greenland. So these sorts, this opening up of the waters in the warm medieval period vastly extended not only the access to game, but also the sort of habitations of the Tula Eskimos, as they are called archaeologically. The living ones are called the Tula people or the Inuit, as I said. So it, 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 this warm medieval period encouraged people to move, but it was soon to be followed by a, a contractive period where people were stuck because of a new climatic trend known as the Little Ice uh, Age, where considerable cooling in the North Atlantic took place, but actually also in the Pacific, Pacific as well. <coughs> and that sort of that sort of, the ice the ice became packed once again and prevented people from going down along the coast. I don't have a picture from the Little Ice Age. Uh, but I thought that I would give you this winter picture from once when I, I visited Tula in, in the month of January. And you know, they have four months without sun. And I had this sense of living in a completely deep frozen and impenetrable world. And all of the sun did shine every summer during the little, little ice age. I had this feeling that this was it. This must have been how it, it was. But what suddenly qualified the or, or Characterized the Tula culture at this particular time was that that the two that the northernmost people they became completely isolated from their southern more southerly uh, neighbors and they were cut off for at least 300 years. They had no contact with their their friends and families further south, and they were left to their own devices while fighting uh, within this framework of a very very harsh uh, climate. Uh, and again, the main obstacle was the Melville Bay, they, because the, the packed ice and the lack of gain over a thousand kilometer stretch made it impossible to, to cover it. In Tula, they could still live off the open waters. Small open waters, I'll come back to that. But it is, it is interesting because when the Danes reached the uh, Greenlandic uh, shores in, in early <coughs> the 18th century, I mean, there had been Norsemen, Nordic people living there, but they had become extinct, or at least they had disappeared, with the same uh, ice, little ice age. But uh, and suddenly the Danes remembered that they had friends and family and this whatever in Greenland, so they began to settle, looking first for these old Norsemen. And, and uh, they came up, and, and what they found were not the Norsemen, but they found the more southern uh, two people. But they never really knew that there were somebody else further north. It had to wait a long time before they became they came into, into the picture. There were rumors and tales about some weird people living elsewhere. But I mean, there are many tales afloat, so they weren't really taken uh, as um, as truth. 
But finally, when the ice again began to, to recede a bit, ships, European ships, could actually reach these northernmost uh, people, these northernmost uh, shores. And, and John Ross was the first person to, to cross the impenetrable Melville Bay for, for, for centuries. I mean, there had been, William Baffin had been up there in 1616, but just for a very brief uh, stage, and then he had to move out again, and he didn't see anybody. But John Ross, he was uh, sent out by the British Admiralty uh, in order to discover the Northwest Passage once again. But he, and, uh, he did not uh, succeed in, in finding uh, the passage, but he did find some uh, un hitherto unknown uh, people. And the, the, the account of the encounter with this unknown tribe is fascinating and often moving. He's actually quite, he's quite elaborate on, on, on this meeting. He just met a small group of men on the ice, uh, but, but uh, he, he was quite taken by them, and he called them the Arctic Highlanders. Uh, he was himself a Scotsman, and he didn't mean derogatory, but just to lie people so that you, you could come across well, in, in the backyard. And I quote him here. The origin of the Arctic Highlanders, or inhabitants of Prince Regent's Bay, that's the name here, of course, gave the bay, is a question as yet involved in peculiar obscurity. They exist in a corner of the world by far the most secluded, which has yet been discovered, and have no knowledge of anything but what originates or is found in their own country. Nor have they any tradition how they came to this spot, or from whence they came, having until the moment of our arrival believe themselves to be the only inhabitants of the universe and the rest and that all the rest was a mass of ice. It is of course debatable what they actually knew. I mean he had an interpreter with him. But uh, I mean it is how to interpret what they say about I mean it's very we don't know what they knew about their own uh, situation. But there is a sense in which in this particular case the discovery goes both ways. Ross and his crew discovered an unknown tribe, but so did, of course, the Arctic Highlanders. From then on, these little people became part of history. And uh, soon, in the wake of Ross's successful uh, voyage, whalers from Europe took to the north, as did, of course, more explorers, like you can see here Elisha Kent Kane. Is the one sitting there, and he drew this picture himself, and it's an edging from his book. But, but what is interesting here is, and you can see it from my little uh, title there, it's called Civilization in Disguise. There is a set in which the, it's no longer just an encounter, it's sort of taking it on in a new way, very deliberately. Um, but he stayed long enough, he stayed there for two years, and he stayed long enough not only to get to know the people, he was very skeptical at first about whether they were peaceful or, 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 or vicious, but he stayed long enough, enough to get to know them and to, to don their clothing because evidently during winter that was the only one that, the only one that, that could stand, withstand the coat. But he also counted the entire population and he suggested that there was about, uh, were about 140 souls. But he also noted that the people were suffering from famine and saw themselves as doomed. But still, he noted also a remarkable sense of community and their keeping track of each other even along this vast coastal stretch. And I quote him here. The narrow belt subjected to their nomadic range cannot be less than 600 miles long. And throughout this extent of country, every man knows every man. There is not a marriage or a birth or a death that is not, not talked over and mentally registered by all. I have a census exactly confirmed by three separate informants which enables me to count by name 140 souls scattered along from Kuswak, the great river at the base of the glacier near Cape Melville, to the Windlove part of Anno Attack. Destitute as they are, they exist both in love and community of resources as a single family. The sites of their huts, for they are so few in number as to not bear the name of villages, are arranged with reference to the length of a dog march 
and to the seat of the hunt. And thus, when winter has built her highway and cemented into one the sea, the islands, and the main, they interchange with each other the sympathies and social communion of man, and diffuse through the darkness and knowledge of the resources and condition of all. So we see here a, a, an elaborate portrait, and he has pages and pages on this, of uh, a small people who are destitute, but they are also to very, very, they sport a well-functioning society, and they live sort of in, in a mutual brotherhood, so to speak. And, and evidently, I mean, there was something to be said for this uh, famine, because only ten years later, after uh, Cain had left, the population was allegedly down to about a hundred people, according to Isaac Hayes, the next in line to report his encounter. He reported on abandoned settlements in Tula and related how, when queried about the fortune of his own people, one of his companions uh, had become very sad and said, Alas, we will soon be gone. And Hayes, Hayes said he would come back, to which his companion replied, Come back soon, or there will be no one to welcome you. This made Hayes reflect further and finally to write when, um, when he was leaving. To contemplate the destiny of this little tribe is indeed painful. There is much in these rude people deserving of, uh, of admiration. Their brave and courageous struggles for bare subsistence against what would seem to us the most disheartening obstacles, often being wholly without food for days together and never obtaining it without encountering danger, makes their whole of life very precarious. The sea is their only harvest field, and having no boats, so that's new, I mean before they, the two people had big boats, in which to pursue the game, they have only to await the turning tide or changing season to open cracks and on which they wander, seeking the seal and walrus which come there to breathe. The uncertain fortunes of the hunt often lead them in the winter time to shelter in ruined harbors of snow, and in summer, the migrating waterfowl come to substitute the seal and walrus which, when the ice fields have floated off, they can rarely reach. So there's this thing to hear us, an increasing a sense of, uh, of doom here. And from the information uh, Hayes obtained from the locals, who also drew him maps of all the settlements along the coast, he, as I said, uh, estimated the entire population to about 100 souls, which is indeed a very remarkable diminution since Dr. Cain left in uh, 1855, as he said. Right. Part of the price paid by the Tuli people eagerly uh, awaiting the, the, the arrival of foreigners and, and goods since the first contact with John Ross was to be exposed to epidemics that toll considerably in a non-resistant population. I mean, there were some gains also, given that um, I mean they could get uh, weapons and, and iron tools and and a lot of things that they did not have access to before. That's why they complicated and sort of sit so to meet these ships when they came. But the epidemics, of course, told rather hard. And in a sense, I mean, we can see they embraced the foreign. They took it on. They wanted to connect. They wanted to take part in barter and exchange. But uh, also, I mean, they, they had to pay a high price. Uh, you can see here on the, uh, yeah, I want to show you here. This is this is again in Madrid Bay, and this is Cape York where they would congregate uh, every year in, in the hope of being able to barter with other whalers or explorers coming up. And in tales uh, co collected by Knud Asmussen in 1903, there is a dramatic story relating how people had learned to barter with the white men's ships, including whalers, and had become well supplied with white, white people's things. But on one occasion, shortly after a ship had left, the people began to fill in, to fall in. More and more of them died, and fearing that the plague would take them all, they fled into the deepest fjord. But the illness followed them, and soon they were all dead, except a few young people. Since then, the fjord has been made the fjord of the dead people. It's this fjord behind them, and it's actually stayed called that, and so the tale is sort of retold in the place name. 
So lots of, of, of actions and, and, and events are actually still to be found. And so sort of hunting feats, etc., are actually very sort of visible in the place names. But of course, in addition to epidemics, the harshness of the environment, where the little ice age actually held its grip a little longer than elsewhere in the North Atlantic re re region, also uh, gave them uh, hard times hunting. This was not only uh, a cause of a decline in resources, but also for want of wood, and thus for deg degrading of their technologies. Previously, and until the little ice ed age, uh, a, a trickle of driftwood had reached their shores by the tail end of the sea current going up along the west coast of Greenland. But this had failed for a long time and left their hunting gear remarkably uh, reduced. That is, of course, noted by most people, and, and, uh, and I, I return here to, to Hayes, and I, I'm approaching the present in a very short while. But on the eve of leaving his faithful companions, I mean, these are all Hayes' own drawings. I mean, there were no photographers at the time, so, so it's, they're very difficult <coughs> to, know, to see from you, but you can see it's always a battle with the environment that he, he depicts, but also uh, this uh, sort of another close companionship with a local to taking him on the sledge. And he said, um, when leaving, I have been ashore taking leave of my friends the Eskimo. They have pitched their tents nearby and poor fellows. I'm truly sorry to, sorry to leave them. They've all been faithful, each in his way, and they've done me most important service. The alacrity with which they have placed their dogs at my disposal Without dogs, I could have done absolutely nothing. This is the strongest proof that they could give me uh, of their devotion and regard. But their, their dogs are to them invaluable treasures, without which they have no security against want and star starvation to themselves and their wives and children. He then muses about their future faith, and I shall, shall not quote all of it, although it's, it, is very <laughs> it is very touching, actually. But he speaks about uh, their, their good nature and intelligence, etc., etc. But then he has to say goodbye to one of his closest friends, and he said, When I took his hand today and told him that I would not come ashore anymore, the tears actually started in his eyes. And I was much touched with his earnest words. It was almost an entreaty Come back and save us. Save them I would and will, if I may be spared to return. And I'm quite sure. Uh, that upon no beings in the whole world could Christian love and Christian charity more worth it for. This is indeed sort of a very close up picture of a, a sense or a state of misery on both partners in the conversation. And apparently they did have sort of a sense of being on the brink of extinction, which is why they sought out these white people so, so eagerly. Now this is a very interesting thing here, because both Ross and Kane had commented on the low level of technology, and Hayes explicitly mentions the mere trickle of driftwood that would again reach the Cape York before bending west. For centuries, even this would have been brought to a halt by the packed ice, and this had resulted in dog sledges made entirely out of walrus and narwhal bone, meticulously pieced together by sealskin skin <coughs> and amazingly well functioning. It was both, of course, highly ingenious and a rather sad testament to the state. This is uh, the sledge that was Ross brought back to the British Museum, so it has survived in this particular state. Otherwise, it would have been recycled. All, thi all things are always recycled in this region. However, the full extent of the technological loss due to the absent wood only occurred to a group of American Inuit who migrated across the narrow strait between Ellesmere Land in Canada and northwest Greenland in the late 1860s. That's after Hayes had left. They amounted to merely a total of 15 people. And of course, being from the other side, where they kept up with the more sort of rigorous to the tradition 
they knew what to expect of a proper hunting community. And a few of them actually lived to tell their story to Knud Rasmussen in 1903. And uh, you can see one of them here. And, and it is a fact that this very tiny group of people, they actually contributed vitally to the boosting of the population at the time. But they also taught people to use the once again available wood for both bows and arrows, fishing spears, and not least kayaks. All of these technologies that they had actually literally forgotten, having been without wood for such a long time. And of course, the wood not only hailed from this trickle of driftwood, but also now from the white sailors, the European explorers and, and travelers. And the old man, Mertusak, he said, we taught them to build kayaks and to hunt from kayaks. Before that, they had only hunted under the ice and had been obliged during the spring to catch as many seals, walruses, and narwhals as they would want for the summer when the ice had gone. In the time, of course, during these 300 years, their old technological skills had been forgotten and indeed become impossible to practice due to the ice. But Merkusak also noted that he and his fellow immigrants had been impressed by the quality of the sledges and by their size and high upright hand coats at the time they had wooden sledges again, but it was another kind that they knew from, from their own side of the, uh, the Smith Sound. And they were much more convenient when you had to travel over long distances. And it's sort of the, the, the sledges that we have, still have today. And they were much better than the ones that the, uh, the American Indians brought with them. So we remember how Hayes had commented that the people had no boats, but with the newcomers from the West, who um, were indeed American descendants of the great whalers and sailors of the prehistoric Tula culture, the Greenlanders were really educated and they certainly took to the kayak. With or without kayaks, people depended on the open aid of water, Polinia, the breathing and feeding place of marine mammals and seabirds. This Arctic oasis, you can see it's, it's actually, this is where people walked over. And this is a satellite photo where you can see that even when the rest is covered, there is this open patch of water. It's due to a whole lot of interconnected uh, uh, biological and oceanographic processes, I will, I will not go into that here, but it's just that this particular place had been what kept them alive, and of course not being able to go out in boats vastly diminished their chances of getting uh, the game from these open water uh, uh, regions. So they could only hunt from the ice edge, and when it was broken and the sea ice had become unstable, their access to the cravers was very circumscribed. Thus the reinvented kayaks vastly extended once again their hunting grounds in the spring and summer when the sea and the fjords gradually opened up. So at this point in time actually extinction had become far less likely. But of course it's still it's still registered as a sort of, it's still registered as a very sort of harsh place to live and uh, and, and people were I mean with Weather and climate could, I mean, not climate, not big climate trends, but, but of course winters and summers would change from one year to the next. So they were constantly on the brink of, of, uh, of not knowing what to do from, from, uh, for the next year. So in a sense, I mean, uh, the, the, pulse, the pulsation of the ice, both in the long term and in the short term, always sort of shaped, co-shaped, this particular community and their their flights and, and their the, what they had to do I and mean, their work to survive in this uh, in this region and of course they were habituated to occasional famines and and uh, they also resorted to social measures to to ward it off such as infanticide etc and there are lots of, of small things that I cannot go into here but it's clearly they. When they faced starvation, they, they looked it right into to its face and, and did something about it. But something new happened definitively when Robert Perry came into the region. He came in the 1890s 
and he portrayed them as excellent and ingenious companions, as honest and hardworking and very artistic, kind of gifted, if outwardly rather uncivilized, as he said. But he, he really came to appreciate them. He came back and forth for, for, for 18 years. He came and went, and of course, I mean, he pursued this dream of reaching the North Pole. And he could not go anywhere in the region without the help of the, the locals. So he co-opted them, and they co-opted him because he was a steady supplier of guns and, and, and utensils and uh, wood and all they needed. So this was sort of a turning point in their relationship to the outer world. So, but, but even though Peary connects very closely to them, uh, he also attempt to stand back and classify the group within a larger scheme. And I've just given you a few quotes here, I know I'm speaking a lot here. But he says that scattered along the shores of the Arctic o o oasis, this little tribe, or perhaps more probably speak speaking, family of Eskimos, for their number about 253 in all, men, women and children, is found maintaining its existence in complete isolation and independence under the utmost stress a savage environment, and then he describes their state. But even he who comes and goes, and is the only time more or less, he still describes them as living in complete isolation, isolation and independence. He's been caught up in this trope that has been cover, governing uh, the pictures of the um, region for such a long time. So all the way through the first encounters with the polar Eskimos, as they were once called, there are echoes of this ancient image of the land beyond and its strange people. And this is, as I said above, uh, the more of any uh, geography. But somehow, when the first proper anthropolo anthropological studies were made and, and, uh, 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 and co collected by no less than Marcel Loos, who summarized the situation of these people, on the basis of all these works that he had known, he had read, he said that the Eskimos, as Miss Sound, were in a miserable state. The expansion of inland ice and the persistence of drifting ice throughout most of the year not only put an end to the arrival of the draft, driftwood, etc., etc. And these unfortunate Eskimo were reduced to such circumstances that they retained merely a memory um, of their former technology. So both by insiders and outsiders, there was this sense of doom related, relating to this community. This was to change forever when the literary expedition came up in the 1903, and that was led by Knud Rasmussen, because for the first time, and he was the one to a few years later to start as a trading station, for the first time the focus was not on the state of destitution, but on their intellectual capacities. It was not simply a matter of a new way of looking. It was also a matter of engaging with people that was that was seen as the same kind of oneself from the very outset and from the first encounter, even if even Rasmus would call the new people another persistent trope in the reality of anthropology. So we move on. Um, after the establishment of the Tulia trading station, and you can see here there's a portrait of some of them in 1909, um, at the, when the building began, there were still about 250 uh, people. Uh, in, and, and soon they began thriving because now they were the guaranteed uh, provisions at least once a year from the south. They could sell their, their skins for, for, and exchange them for whatever they needed in, in the shop. So there was a def definitively a new sense of peace and calm, still some epidemics and a lot of accidents of course, but the population began to grow rapidly. There was a doctor appointed as a full-time doctor at the trading station, so in a sense this colonial encroachment on their, their um, region made a lot of good for their uh, survival in a sense. But then it shouldn't last long, but, I, but, but today, even today when I talk to people in, in, the, in Tool, I talked to a lot of people who were children in the 1930s and 40s, and they remember it as a very, very fantastic time. It's not simply nostalgia. It's also that it was a time when everybody had enough, and they still saw each other 
as connected and as family related took responsibility for everybody across this entire region. Um, so a sense of calm settled, but this was not to last very long, however, because in uh, 1952, 51 to 52, uh, there was built an American air base. It was a result of the uh, Cold War between yeah, East and West, as you know. And uh, Denmark turned its sort of more or less blind eye to this establishment. But what seemed in, in the middle of the uh, two region. The case, I think, is, is very troubling, at least for, 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 for Danish politicians today, because there was a political smoke screen covering up uh, the, the process, the very sort of unpleasant process by which uh, this uh, tool station was established. And I have an anthropological eye, eyewitness in Jean Mallory who spent the years uh, 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 1950 to 51 in the region and who came to Tula uh, from a sojourn further north and who did not believe his eyes when he looked down on the plain from the mountain. And he continues. Uh, he describes that a city of hangars and tents of sheet metal and aluminium rose dazzling in the sun all among smoke and dust on a plain that yesterday had been empty. The most fantastic of legends took form beneath our eyes. We descended the snow slope, with slow, snow slope which shone before us. Our astonishment became stupor. As far as we could see, there were lines of lorries lifting the iron mountains of cases. Steel framework raised its great arms to the sky. Along the slopes, excavators with enormous jewels scraped away in smoke and steam, removing earth and rubbish, um, which were vomited into the sea by continuously moving buckets. The noisy breathing of this town reached us. It was a dull rumbling of ceaselessly turning motors. In the grayness, dozens of aeroplanes were sight circling. One of them nearer to us came and went like a great bumblebee mixing its personal solemn note with the mountain of This eruption of civilization seen from the glacier was sinister. Our dogs howled like death. Two of them threw themselves on one another. We intervened without energy. The return to men was a failure. This is, of course, a major implication of this dystopia, and it lingered for a long time among the people there. And what is interesting is here is a picture taken by an American soldier uh, at the time, and it says that uh, the neighbors of the base is a handful of Eskimos. So they'd be reduced to neighbors and to just a handful. It was the center of the place. You can see the emblematic Tule Mountain there again, that was also behind the Tule Station. And uh, now they are reduced, and uh, after uh, a few years, they were even forcefully relocated. This is one of the few ruins that is still left from their dwellings. And uh, these were, were ordinary dwellings for the people. And the, col the colonial administrators lived in, in their wood houses, but these uh, turf houses were actually very, I mean, it was easy to build and easy to build in a new place. In a sense. But uh, what happened here was that after a few years, the Tuli people were forced to move out. They'd become a liability. And, and also, because I mean, they were all sorts of uh, gear and, and uh, long distance rockets in place there, what have you. So they, they really couldn't coexist in this space. And um, at very short notice, four days to be precise, people had to abandon not only their houses and their huts, but the very the whole of the middle part of the region that had been theirs for thousands of years. The breakup not only regrouped people, it also destroyed the integrity of the community. In the first few years after the re relocation, people would actually stop over occasionally on this uh, their old in their old settlement, and, and because the old would have houses were still standing. But then, and it could almost hope for a war loss or something. But the military management would not have it. So it was decided to burn down all the houses. That's why there's so few left. Otherwise, things keep very well in this very dry, high Arctic landscape. So it was decided to burn them down so as not to lure them back into their own houses. 
So this, of course, uh, severed them from their past, and this sense of being severed from the center of their community still lingers in, in many ways in present day uh, uh, community. Populations continued to grow, but it had become dispersed. They couldn't really make all the way. This air base, military presence, had sort of destroyed the middle hunting ground and, and of course, all of the closer settlements. So what happened was that these, this handful of neighbors now figures at this particular place in the Thule Air Base Heritage Center, Heritage Center as a feature of the past. But it's, it's, it's very <laughs> it's, it's tempting to ask whose heritage is that? Because for some, for some others, it is still lived life. And that takes me finally to the present, where life is still for real, so to speak. It unfolds on ancient environmental premises, and in spite of many modern opportunities that are now open to all of them, social life is precarious and in a new way due to the uh, rather rapid changes in climate and not least in the ice conditions and is of course a measure of climate change up there. But they're still trying to stick it out and I think they will. I mean occasionally when I come back after having been away for, for, for some time, they'll say, well, in a few years we are no longer here, just like they took Hayes and Cain before. But the question is, of course, again, what they mean by we. We are no longer, meaning perhaps that we, as the hunters, we know those who have still live on these ancient, in these ancient ways, I mean, how um, they may not be there, but other people may. They are still totally dependent on hunting from the north water. And here you can see a camp at the ice edge where they're waiting for game, waiting for particular tidal waves, bringing game, whales, and walruses in particular at this particular moment into their, uh, within their reach. But they are certainly, I have to be a bit quick here, I can see time is running, so you should have time to pose questions. But the sea ice is still the most important uh, part of the infrastructure and it is becoming increasingly uh, precarious. But there's no way to, to replace it as yet. I mean, they have small motorboats now, but they, it can't go through pack ice in any way. So communication, <coughs> once again, has become uh, more tenuous and this accounts for a gradual depopulation of the smaller settlements. There's one now down to about 14 people, and it won't be long before they leave. I mean, it's very difficult to, if they can't get in touch with the rest of the community for at least half of the year, it is a bit long to stick it out. And it's a place where, of course, there's no electricity, no more, right, no nothing. So I think it, it's a matter of a few years. It's only a couple of years ago, another settlement finally closed down. So you can see this movement going on all the time. And meanwhile, of course, also people are moving south from the main town. But also, I mean, it's not simply a, 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 a tale of doom, it's also a tale of new opportunities opening out. Some of them may be quite poisonous in a sense, but some of them may be for real. As you can see here, it's sort of an, an Arctic mapping exercise here, saying that sort of evolve, tracing evolving opportunities in the Arctic, I'm sorry, the word seems to. And, and uh, what you can see here is, uh, I could better read it here, I think. Uh, the, 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 these green areas are supposed to be areas of future Arctic tourism. So that's one hope. This is the Tula region. And as you can see, they're right also across from the Lancaster Sound, the Northwest Passage that is now finally opening up. So maybe, just maybe, can they get something out of this? And then there is further south, there is all these, these sort of petrol and, and, and oil exploration, but that again is sort of very counterproductive to the Tula people because it creates a lot of noise and all this exploration creates a lot of seismic noise that sort of blocks the migration routes of the uh, main mammals. So there's lots of troubles, but there are also uh, some uh, hopes. And of course the yellow ones are sort of growing fisheries and, and actually a more sort of 
fishable fish moving up here, so that's another avenue that is open. But all of these new territorialities, and that's a more sinister aspect of, of the geopolitical situation in the Arctic, is that there's these sort of territorial raids for the North Pole. And that means that there's also this sort of, there's a sinister presence, there are more military sort of coming up there. And, but they're, they're ready to embrace it if it means work. I mean, so long as they can stay, uh, but it takes a lot, they say, possibly we can have the last port of call here. But when you see the present port, it seems far away. It's just sort of a big, sort of a lagoon within a small stone reef where uh, no ships can anchor uh, close to, to this region. So there's a lot of things that should happen before this becomes a real sort of opening. And what is happening when one is there is that every year they are still celebrating themselves as sledge drivers and hunters. Every year, around the 1st of May, um, they have these uh, sledge races. And it, it, it's really one big celebration of good sledge drivers. And here's the winner a couple of years ago. So they're still celebrating this life while also looking out for whatever opens up uh, in the future. What is difficult is, of course, for the elderly people. Because if they're, and for the young the middle-aged are the ones who are still sort of keeping up with this. The younger ones are tempted to go south, and uh, the elder ones, they, cannot, they don't have strength to go hunting anymore. And if their sons and daughters don't catch as much, then there's no need to share out, and they're totally dependent on a money economy that is still sort of very fragile in, in the region. So, in many places, um, that's more southern in Greenland. I found this in a museum. The hunting life has become heritage, even within Greenland. It's become a museum piece. But up there, it is actually still for real. And uh, so the, the question is again I mean, what should we mean by extinction? I'm closing now. Um, because has all of these sort of movements, these cases of near extinction, has it really been extinction, or has it just been sort of a temporary setback? How do we define it when we're dealing with, with the communities? Um, is it perhaps a part of a normal development also now in the region because I mean, everything is warming up and maybe new possibilities will open? So what is it and who, who is it and what is it that has become extinct? What is the we that say perhaps in 10 years we are no longer here? So I say here that uh, we may see this as a sort of permanent state of extinction, at least for these centuries where they've been back in, in history. But we can also see it in another way as sort of a very strong state of endurance. I mean, they, they, they made it, and they're still there, and they love their place, and they'd rather not move south, whatever they have to offer. So with that, I, I go so we can discuss it. I'm, Sorry, I'm taking so long. There's a bit of technological talking. Thank you so much. Yeah, so well, we have 15 minutes of uh, questions. So um, anybody would like to raise a question? Yes. Uh, I actually have more of a, an observation than a question. Um, I'm an archaeologist, so yes. I constantly think about the past. And one of the things that really struck me uh, in what you were talking about was your example of the folks that came over from Baffin Island yeah. and uh, yeah. sort of interjected in some ways of doing things that have been lost, so to speak. Yeah. And what it reminded me of is uh, there in, in the prehistoric past, there's this idea that one of the things that really distinguishes modern humans is basically not having a glass ceiling on knowledge. So that so that somewhere in all of humanity there are these reservoirs of, in this case, traditional knowledge, which can be reintroduced back into groups. And so I think that might feed in a little bit also to your, your yes. extinction. That's a very interesting observation, yes. So Yeah, I think I think you will really Okay, we have been talking about permanent state of extinction. So would you consider this climate change a different kind of threat? And my old, you already posed the open question of what extinction or what is sure. yeah. the thing which will not be there. So do you have an, could you please elaborate on that? I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, 
think it is a very difficult question, actually. Because what do we mean if we speak, for instance, of cultural extinction? Do we mean that they have gradually adapted to new times, or so that they no longer do what they used to do? Or do we mean that, that they have disappeared completely? But I, guess, I think about time in this process. I can understand extinction, but it's sort of a sudden thing. You know, like all the dinosaurs that were, became extinct with the fall down of this meteor or whatever it was. Well, that's sort of an extinction you can sort of <laughs> agree to. But I think when it comes to humans, I think it's much more complicated. Because also all these different waves of prehistoric cultures coming into great possible tiny populations always. But can we really know whether it's extinction or whether they... We don't know whether they wanted back and went back into America. We don't know whether they were just sort of becoming few and then finally fewness sort of killed them. I don't know. And we have the same problem for the Norsemen. We lived in, in, in South Greenland for about uh, 400 years and suddenly they were no longer there. But, uh, and, and everybody talked about them becoming extinct with a little ice age. But what is much more likely is that, I mean, they gradually changed their ways of doing things and they began to live, you know, probably there was some left, and they began to be much more like the uh, two the Eskimos coming down from the north and meeting them halfway, and they sort of gradually took over. So there is a sense in which uh, they may have become extinct, but they may also live on <laughs> in, in, in other uh, people. And we can see there have been meetings and exchanges, and now new genetic studies certainly show that, that the population of southwestern Greenland is much more mixed than had been uh, thought before. It's, 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 it's different in, in the north, but of course even they bring in spouses and, and, uh, and is that <laughs> a remedy to what this thing? What is that? I think it, it's, it is fascinating to ponder when and why we may say that something social or cultural has literally become extinct. You've seen it, you've surely worked on that before. So um, thank you so much for your talk. I, I'm curious, what do the two people attribute the thinning of the ice to? I mean, yeah. you would say, yes, yeah. it's climate change, but you talked about these military installations. Yeah. You have researchers going there taking ice yeah. cores. You have the, the vibrations yeah. from the sound. So what, what do they attribute this thinning or, or precarity yeah, that's, to? Yeah, that's, I thank you for posing that question, because it is very important to understand that they, they are well-versed in, say, notions of climate change. I mean, because there's so many researchers coming up there measuring the, the suit on the glaciers and what have you, and, and tracing the melt off, all that. But, but the, and they also know about the, uh, the climate reports, of course, and they have, have satellite pictures of, of the ice. But, but they see it, I mean, from another perspective, and they accept all that. But for them, what matters is the, the, the changes sort of in their everyday lives. And they attribute most of it to, to warming, generally, of the sea, and the new pattern of sea currents, because what they experience is that sometimes the, the sea ice melts from from below. I mean, usually they could sort of see on top of the ice how how how, how solid it was. But now there's tricks. They're playing tricks because there are new currents, new warming, and new also new um, uh, proportions between salt water and fresh water, new movements. Uh, so all of it sort of contributing to this change. And between themselves and the yeah, anthropologists in this case, they also sometimes blame the, uh, the, uh, the scientists working on the inland ice with these core drains where they take all these ice arc, so 3,000 years, 300,000 years of ice up in, in the core, and they can, it's sort of an archive of changing climates uh, globally, and they can see when Vanuatu or some other volcano in the Pacific <laughs> is sort of erupted in the 1200s, it's, it's there, and they can measure the amount of, of whatever in this ice core. So it's a huge and very important archive. But uh, some of the hunters I've, I've talked to, uh, to without, about this, they really, they're very frightened because they don't like these holes in the ice. And they think that that's one of the reasons why there's so much water now running out under the glaciers, sort of making them run faster. 
precipitating their sort of calming processes and all of this sort of thundering noise for those two months of the year where they have open waters or where it's extending up. But, but still, so, and they can see, of course, they're very observant, they can see there's so much water running out under the glaciers. And that this is a scientific fact, and it has to do with the, with the sort of meltdown of the, the ice cap, the surface of the ice cap due to the warming. And it's already shrinking so much, in fact, so that the, the land is, is, is raising up there, meaning that the sun comes one day earlier <laughs> than it used to be. <laughs> so even, I mean, even this tiny, tiny lifting, a couple of centimeters, gives them one day more of sun. That's a good news. But apart from that, I mean, they, they fear that it's going too rapidly. And so it's, they blame the drillers and they blame, generally, the Americans. Uh, it, it's not sort of our block, but the, the, the Americans and the base who started also digging into the ice and, and carving out you know, sort of prospected cities under the ice and installing uh, atomic uh, uh, reactors and, 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 so, and, and yeah, and they said that this this is where the the, the whole began. So this is, again, it's, it's certainly a turning point in their conception of the fragility of their environment, because uh, and it's true that the Americans they did try to, to develop an under ice city, but they hadn't uh, foreseen how plastic the ice was. So everything just fell apart, and they had to give up on the atomic thing because it would it would. Dissonate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's you in the, in the back seat at yeah, first. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, so, talking about the previous question earlier that you described this uh, new site for the oil and gas, uh, which is becoming better. Yeah. And I read this earlier that as uh, the region is moving towards independence, actually, it's more that it's trying to be uh, economically also independent from Denmark. And yeah. So, it's trying to approve more projects for drilling oil and other natural resources. Yeah. So, uh, like, whereas Denmark initially wasn't so keen on it, because it didn't mean, it wasn't like focusing on those revenues and uh, really having to depend on them for the revenues. Yeah. So I was just thinking that how, uh, even though like, they're moving towards more uh, a democratic structure where they have to go over uh, process, but it seems that since uh, our yeah. economic system is one where we are based to the uh, like basically uh, having exploration yeah. resources for places like these where they are not other place to have uh, economic output coming. So how do we how uh, how yeah. do we yeah. that No, I think it's 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 a very it is a very good point. First of all, um, Greenland has self room I mean, and they can get independence any minute they they want to, which is fair and fine. Uh, but but and of course, it sets them on a course to getting enough money to be sort of to be truly independent, to not need needing this uh, the support from Denmark, which Denmark gladly uh, invests. So that's, it's not an issue in, in terms of, of, of relationships between the Danes and Greenland, of course, in a small sense. But it, it made the Greenlandic government jump too fast to the oil and gas adventure, and they gave out concessions to too many uh, projects at the same time. But they're all withdrawn now because they realize that the infrastructure is hopeless. And, I mean, there were sort of some uh, ocean drillings in, in central western Greenland uh, in a fantastic, wonderful bay with big hump waves, etc. But they're also full of pack ice. It's one of the most productive gla glaciers, so riding. And they just gave up and said, what, what happens? I mean, everybody was thinking of this catastrophe in the Mexican Gulf. Because it's such an iceberg, it's of a scale you can't dream of, and it could tumble over this platform and cause sort of heavy damage and actually uh, hit the very fragile ecosystem in these icy waters very hard. So they were drawing, that goes also for an aluminium melter, for an iron project, even for water. Because, of, I mean, there are so few people, and, and if, you look at, if you look back, I mean, it looks like that a lot of time. It's just sort of barren lands with ice-covered tops and, uh, and uh, not much to, to support sort of this an, an influx of new people and so there are many problems so what what they're thinking of now many Greenlanders also is to to, to 
to perhaps do more so for the fisheries and for the tourism and for the other more sustainable uh, prospects and then perhaps go a little slower with the rest of it. It, it will come of course but there are also lots of precious metals in, in Greenland that can be, be taken out but it takes, I mean it's, it's, it's an impenetrable country still in many ways. So it takes a lot of energy and money to get it out so, so it need, you need strong backers and concessions. Yeah, I think it's you in the, in the light breaks. Um, you said earlier that um, they're very observant about their yeah. surrounding. Um, think about the idea that um, the, the sea ice is thinning. Yeah. Um, what kind of um, uh, different ways of perception do you see between you know Westerners or the anthropologists yeah. Yeah. or um, people who, who go there? And the and the two yeah. hunters, the way they see space organized around themselves. Yeah, I mean, first of all, they have much more detailed and concrete knowledge of the ice. So whatever they see on the satellite, they can't use it when they go hunting. Mm -hmm. They still have to read the ice, and they know that from ages of practicing. So it's a practical knowledge in, in many ways. But it is, of course, also one that can be theorized. It can be explained, and it, it's not in any sense of contrast or opposition mm -hmm. to scientific knowledge, it's just another way of seeing, a, seeing the world and living with it. Mm -hmm. When researchers then come in and they count the waves, for instance, from small planes, and then they estimate how many are submerged at any point in given time, and they say, well, there are 4,000 now waves in the fjord now. And the hunters, of course, wonder, them, well, how, how, <laughs> how did that come about? And then they're given a quota of, say, 65 waves that they're up to hunt. And what they don't really understand is how you come from this size of the, the entire estimated stock and then the quota that they are given. And they're very much for protection of species, that's not it. It's just they want an explanation. And I think the biologists are working with some of them now. I mean, if you can't beat them, then co-op them. <laughs> so you're a and, and, and of course they can explain how they base this on the reproductive cycles and that, that, that. It's, it's so easy that they explained it to me, they can just sit down for a quarter of an hour and explain it to them, and they would love to know. And of course, gradually, they do know, but, but I think so, so there's no opposition in terms of, of analysis or, or analytical skills between scientific and, and local knowledge here. And all knowledge is, of course, located in, in, when it comes to it, because it takes off in a particular place and deals with concrete questions. So. Yes. Uh, you showed the photo of sledge. A what? A photo of sledge. The sledge. The sledge, yes. Uh, like from 19th century, early yeah. 19th century. From 1818, yeah. Uh, then those are made of animals. Yeah, they're made of, of whale bone mm -hmm. and walrus bone and, and uh, whatever they could find. And uh, still they made it look like a sledge. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Then we have seen the uh, climate change yeah. and the of change, yeah. uh, like a long time period. Uh, then I was wondering if like, these materials, details of stretch have changed through the time, then today hunters... Uh, no, it's, like, it's, it's still, like, uh, no, it's, it's practically still the same. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what qualifies them is that they're very long and rather heavy. And they're long because they, they must be able to, 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 to span over cracks in the ice. I mean, that goes also, that went also like that 100 years ago. I mean, there are always cracks in the ice at a certain point in time. Now they just come uh, earlier. So they have to span this, and, they have, and they're geared to, towards, to, towards uh, going on the sea ice, not in the mountains or in, in woods or anything like some uh, Alaskan and other sleds. So they have a very particular, and it's, it's always been like that, as far as we can see, bigger, and and uh, and, and that's where the, the Baffinlanders came in, in in the 1860s. They were actually quite observant. They saw that these people, these their new people, I mean, they had developed another kind of sledge. Precisely, that's why they insist on calling it a sledge. It's a different kind. It's more heavy. That's your, also the name that was used in, in most of these old stories that I love to repeat, <laughs> but, but it's not these sort of lighter sleds that jump everywhere. 
and they saw it. They saw that this was what they had to adopt, and then together they made a perfect uh, set of, of uh, technologies. Um, Kirsten's going to have to leave right after the talk, but if there are any other questions, um, maybe we could pull together a few. Uh, yes. And, and Rebecca back there. So maybe we can take like three questions and then you can answer sure. them how you want. So I just was very curious about um, your writing background inspiration and the process because I was very moved by the story, but also how you told in the chapters that those of us read in preparation for the chat. Sorry, I'm not sure I got it. Oh just your writing your writing. Your your yeah. your writing was just I was very moved by how you told this story. Oh, so thank you. you're writing, you know, background or mm -hmm. process or inspirations. For example, I'm interested in maybe not surprised to hear that you're that you do, you know, Shakespearean theater. I was just curious about kind of you know, the language and how you can tell these things. Okay, and other questions? So two more questions? Yes. Um, thank, thanks for your talk. Um, um, my question is did you observe right now? Any wave of uh, any evidence of wave of uh, immigration uh, among the younger people, and how does it get impact on the on the future? Yeah. Any last ones? One more. Last one. So, and mine is kind of connected to this question of language, which is I noticed an interesting pattern in your talk where you use words like infrastructure to describe the natural environment as well, and I was wondering if that's related in any way to the Kula people's language and how they discuss their natural environment versus their built environment. Um, I thought that was an interesting distinction. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's an astute observation, actually. Yes, um, I've come to see it as infrastructure because I've traveled a lot with them on their sledges. So it's, it's very much part of, of what they have to do. It's like a railway, in a sense. I mean, and when railway breaks down, connections between the settlements uh, breaks down. But about the, the so, so the language, I mean, again, um, I, I seek to, to keep up true to, to what they say. I'm not very good at their language. I, I can follow the drift of a conversation, but fortunately, they speak Danish also. They've had Danish school teachers all. So, so that and helps me a lot, I mean, which it, it, I, it's a, I mean, I'm ashamed, but I mean, that's how it is. Because I started so late and, you know, come from months at a time over 10 years. So, uh, but anyway, I feel fairly confident that I got it right because uh, I, 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 I seek to find a language that isn't sort of eliminating, it isn't too generalizing. You could say that infrastructure is sort of a general, generalizing term, but then again, it's also very concrete. I think that is very important to me that I keep this uh, a sense of what I call uh, an, an analog analysis. I, I should not step too far out. I mean, I could come in here and say, Heidegger says, and Heidegger says a lot. And I mean, we, we've all read say, people who do say a lot. It, it makes a lot of sense to read them. But it, it wouldn't really make sense to draw in Heidegger. But some of the things that his work could have inspired to like sort of in more phenomenological way, could be interesting reference points. So keep keep it on the level and also in seeing it as a collaboration with people rather than a study of people. Because there's no way it's a very, very silent people. And they're really those journalists coming up, stick putting a microphone to their head and saying, What do you think about climate change? <laughs> you know, that kind of question. I mean how how can they ever answer such a question? It's their life for God's sake. So they just they tend now to, to go in and close the doors when these sort of these uh, very very busy journalists and filmmakers are always filmmakers filming the last Eskimo and some of them are getting very tired of being portrayed as the last Eskimo because they're just living their lives but it, but also they're very good at uh, exploiting the incomers because they have to serve them exploiting them using them. So, because they have to take people out on sledges and people have to pay, so it's become another resource in a sense. And the tourists are coming, but, but only for a very, very short period of time. Because it has to be bright and sunny, and so it's not too cold, and it has to be before the ice is gone. So, it's virtually just a month where it's possible to, to 
take tourists around. So it's, it's not a big business as yet, but they're using it. But uh, I had to, to answer also the, the last question on, uh, on the, the young people. And uh, it is true that the young people, they have tended to move south over the past few years. So, so while the old people are dying out, the young people are moving out. It leaves uh, the, the middle ground to the middle age. And there are many of them who really want to stay, and also relatively young middle-aged people staying there. But the young have been uh, lured away and perhaps seeking further education. They have a very good school up to the 10th uh, grade in, in Pranak, but, uh, but uh, they uh, move down perhaps in, in pursuit of further education or other opportunities, but there are very, very few opportunities in Greenland. And many, many unemployed people and many youngsters don't have a clue about what they should do, and that applies north and south and right. So some of them come back and say, well, then in that case we'd rather be here. And some of them are beginning to, to go out again with their fathers or fathers and daughters. I have a couple of, of very recent examples of young people who join in with the big family and say, well, now we, we go this way, their fathers are, I think they're extremely happy about it. So they're good. I mean, so, so, so who knows what's happening? And they're also ready to be there when new possibilities may open. And they can also eventually perhaps cater for the, the uh, tourists and the journalists and the filmmakers from all over the world who will come in. So, but it is an issue, and it's an issue that has uh, uh, taught uh, some of the, uh, the, the politicians in, in the, the, uh, the, the capital of Greenland that it, perhaps it would be better just to close down all of these um, settlements. It's not the only place where there are small settlements, but let's close down two altogether. It, it's too expensive to keep, and we have to keep a weekly flight in and out uh, and, and helicopters to the settlements at least sometime. So, but then again, they suddenly think that um, not only is it the last vestige of who they all were, but it's also I mean, in these sort of geopolitical times, it is very, very important to have a presence in the region, just to have somebody living there. Uh, and, and these days, you cannot overlook those people who actually live there. Why, when the Americans said they, they, when this base was built, I mean, I think sincerely that the Americans saw the, the region as empty. I mean, this handful of Eskimos, they could go somewhere else. Enough space, plenty of space. So they didn't take sort of their actually life seriously. Mm -hmm. they saw it was a wasted space anyway. I mean, with so few people, they could just move out. But that's not happening today. So they have it. They have a trump card there, and I think increasingly they tend to use it, and they're becoming very. Easy. They have a strong voice now, and they're not sort of being told any, anything and everything by people from the south. So, so things are changing. In, in many ways, and it's still a wonderful place. Thank you so much.